Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in today. I'm Caroline Rohn, Vice President of Global Health and Patient Access at Pfizer and President of the Pfizer Foundation. At Pfizer, we know that global health innovation can take place anywhere in the world. And as part of our work to accelerate that innovation, the Pfizer Foundation leads the Global Health Innovation Grants Program, which combines both grant investments with technical support to help our local partners navigate really unique and fluid challenges that they face in providing healthcare to their communities. The GIG program, as we affectionately call it, is managed in partnership with Innovations in Healthcare, a nonprofit organization hosted by Duke University. And I'm super excited today to be joined by Krishna Udara Kumar, founding director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center, to discuss how the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is affecting innovators on the ground in low and middle income countries and how some of these groups are pivoting their work to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and why he ultimately thinks that science will win. Krishna, we're so happy to have you. Thanks for joining us. Great to be with you today. So let's dive right in. I know that everyone wants to hear from you. Your work focuses on identifying the best innovations and innovators, especially in low resource settings. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what you do? Sure, at Innovations in Healthcare, all of our work is really founded on our belief that everyone deserves to thrive. And our vision is a world where innovation improves health for all. And so it's really those principles of equity that drive our work and our team forward. We're organized, as you noted, as a nonprofit hosted in Duke, and almost 10 years ago, were founded jointly by Duke, McKinsey and & Company, and the World Economic Forum. Our work is really about scouring the world to find and curate the very best innovations in health and healthcare, especially focused on low resource settings where we know that the needs are the highest, but where also some of the most creative and transformative solutions are happening. We have curated over 10 years a network of 99 social enterprises that are improving cost, quality, and access to essential health services and technologies in almost 100 countries globally. The work we do is to find and curate these organizations, but also to provide direct and indirect support, build partnerships to see them scale their efforts and their solutions all around the world. We also bring together public and private sector organizations, both to help scale innovations, but also to improve health systems and infect policies as ways to do that. Through this work, we're engaging and supporting with innovators and innovations all over the world, helping to identify and address the most important and urgent challenges we have in health today. Well, thanks for telling our audience a little bit more about your work. And I know one of the things I love about partnering uh, with you on this project is that we get to see these really fantastic innovators who are facing so many challenges and overcoming them. What's been interesting also to me about the COVID-19 pandemic is that we haven't always heard so much here in the U.S. about what's happening on the ground in low and middle income countries. Given the ongoing spread of the pandemic, what challenges are you hearing about from the organizations that you're working with? What are they facing and what are they struggling with? Yeah, in this um, crisis, we've really tried to engage very deeply with grassroots organizations to understand what the needs are and support them as effectively as we can. Uh, We're certainly distressed by the burden that's growing uh, and the needs, uh, recognizing that they're dynamic and changing day by day, especially as the situation evolves in different parts of the world. Many of the innovators that we work with and support are frankly scrambling just to stay afloat, both financially as well as operationally. They're struggling with how to access information. So they're being given and fed information from every source possible and being able to identify the best and most useful information and also to understand where misinformation is coming from is really important uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Being able to access best practices, supplies like PPE is also a growing concern in many parts of the world. Uh, making sure that many of the innovators we work with that come from the private sector have strong connections to the public sector so that they can mount coordinated responses to the pandemic is something that we continue to see evolve. And then finally, being able to access capital and funding both to maintain their operations, but also to meet some of these growing needs. Um, So while these challenges grow, we're also heartened by knowing that many innovators have taken their entrepreneurial spirit to heart 
and are either developing new solutions or adapting what they're doing to make sure that they're serving their clients and their communities. And we also are really glad to see that in parts of the world like West Africa or Southeast Asia, where there's been an experience recently in dealing with epidemics, whether that's SARS, Ebola, that there are enormous lessons to be learned and shared with the rest of the world. And so we hope that we're doing a small part in being able to share those lessons as well. Well, I'm so glad you, you're you talking about the solutions because uh, I know we have talked about over the years the fact that local problems really have to benefit from local solutions. So I would love it if you could talk a little bit more about some of the ways the groups are pivoting and creating solutions to f that they face um, as they take on COVID-19. Yeah, and again, part of what keeps me excited and optimistic about the work we do is really just seeing the energy, the enthusiasm and creativity of innovators around the world trying to solve these challenges locally. And I might categorize the sorts of solutions we're seeing into three buckets. The first is really adapting solutions for evolving needs. And this is everything from developing and deploying chatbots in low resource settings so that communities can do things like symptom checks for COVID or access mental health services during lockdowns. So organizations like Maya that are operating in Bangladesh or TNH Health in Brazil are doing that. We're seeing organizations deploy advanced analytics and biosensors to be able to do symptom surveillance and disease prediction. Organizations like Bioformis, that's part of our network. The second category of solutions we're seeing are organizations really redoubling their efforts to make sure that they can continue to provide access to essential services during the pandemic. So uh, innovators like Penda Health that are operating primary care clinics uh, in, in and around Nairobi, Kenya, are doing everything that they can to make sure that uh, the community continues to gain access to high quality, low cost primary care services. And then finally, we're starting to see more and more adaptation across boundaries in a sink, especially heartening to see the lessons learned from low resource settings from low and middle income countries starting to be applied in high income countries, including the US. So one of our partner organizations, Demagi, who have developed data solutions used by community health workers around the world, including in prior epidemics, have now brought their technology solution as well as their broader approach and partnered in San Francisco to support contact tracing. We're seeing similar work happening in Massachusetts, partnered with Partners in Health. And we're especially proud uh, as a team based in North Carolina that we've been able to create new partnerships to apply global lessons learned to support community-based COVID prevention and response strategies in rural North Carolina. Well, I love that you talk about the sharing of best practices between the developed and developing world. So frequently we imagine that only the developed world can share those experiences. And we know that not to be true, particularly in the work that we're supporting uh, with our innovators. So I'm thrilled that you brought that up. It's also great for me to hear a little bit about some of the organizations that I've had the privilege to visit like Penda Health in Kenya and Partners in Health. Um, it's fantastic to hear how they're pivoting during this very, very difficult time. Now, as you talk about the solutions, is there anything surprising or unusual about the approach of any of the grantees that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I think the most surprising and uh, and positive uh, approach to all of this is the speed by which we're approaching innovation. So I think we really are starting to see uh, communities, organizations come together to recognize that the depth of the crisis requires enormous and coordinated responses all over the world. So we're starting to, inno to see innovators move at a pace uh, that's unprecedented, in, at least in the, the work that we're starting to see. But I think we've also seen that um, raise issues that are really important to keep a uh, sense of during a crisis. The first is really, what are we doing around ethical and responsible innovation? So while we may be racing to develop solutions, especially new technologies that unlock data uh, and enable us to respond better in real time, I hope that we're also collectively asking the right questions of, of what the limits are for new technology in terms of ethics and responsibility is we wanna make sure that we're not letting the genie out of the bottle in some sense, in terms of surveillance, in terms of population data uh, privacy uh, that we can't really go back to once a crisis is over. So ensuring that uh, we continue to innovate quickly, but also responsibly is something that we're deeply committed to. 
And the second is ensuring that the principles of access and equity also feed into as much of the innovation that's happening as possible. We know that whenever solutions become available, whether that's some of the diagnostics already happening now or in the future, more therapeutics and vaccines, that there will be uneven distribution uh, no matter how hard we try. Nevertheless, we feel like everyone needs to really be committed to understanding and planning for equity now and ensuring that we're actually tracking and working towards stronger equity as a key component of our global response to this crisis. I'm so glad you brought up the concept of equity because that's obviously very near and dear to Pfizer's heart. It is one of our core values, and we also are engaging with a number of stakeholders to think through equitable access to any potential vaccines or treatments. So as we come to a close, um, what our audience may not know is that you wear a lot of different hats and you're, you're quite a busy man. You're a practicing physician, which is such a noble role, but you also obviously have your role at Innovations in Healthcare and at Duke at the Global Health Institute. With the perspectives of, of what you've talked about from the US and globally, given all this interesting background, we would love uh, to understand your uh, perspective on what science will win means to you. Yeah, to me, science will win uh, really is a unifying phrase and, and also one that's deeply comforting as somebody whose life is dedicated to understanding, to advancing and applying science. I think uh, it really is about uh, taking rigorous approaches and, and, and relying on the science to make sure that we're eventually mounting an effective response to this and to future crises. So whether it's taking care of a patient in a hospital uh, or supporting innovators on the ground in Kenya or India, or working with policymakers to ensure that we're helping to create the health system of the future, and all the work that we do, we are deeply committed to science, data, and evidence. So uh, the idea that science will win is one that also, to me, means that we all have to commit to generating as well as using the best data and the evidence that's possible for us as we make decisions on policy as well as in practice. Uh, one very small way that we're trying to support that work is through an effort we have called the Launch and Scale Speedometer that's supported by the Gates Foundation, where we have spent two years really building the data infrastructure and models that will allow us to track over time what's happening as well as what's working and what's not as innovations develop are introduced in various countries and scale up. And we hope that bringing that evidence and unlocking the power of the data of what's happening, especially in low and middle income countries, will enable all of us to follow the science and make better decisions over time. So unfortunately for our audience, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, Krishna, I just want to say a big thank you for not only caring for patients, but for also the great support and work you're doing to advance science and data and ensure that our global communities are prepared to care for individuals suffering through the COVID-19 pandemic. And for all of you who tuned in, we're grateful that you took time to listen today. And until the next time we're together, stay safe and stay healthy.